Okay, I think we'll slowly start this webinar. Once again, welcome to everyone uh, to this webinar where we will be talking about some of our programs in social sciences. Uh, my name is Maria Lindblad. I work at Lund University as an international marketing manager, and I will be uh, moderating and hosting the webinar today. And we will be talking to our lovely panel here who will introduce themselves shortly. Um, just for information, this webinar is going to focus on the specific programs that are with us today in social sciences. If you have uh, questions about other programs in social sciences, there is a second webinar uh, just an hour after this one finishes. Uh, where the other programs are represented. There is also a student panel webinar even later this afternoon. You'll find all those links on our webpage uh, under the applicant weeks. And so if you are interested in any of our social sciences programs, you will get a lot of information today. So please feel free to join any of those as well. Uh, we are going to try to focus on the program information and the content of the programs today and uh, to get the most out of our panelists who are here with us. So if you have more general questions about how to apply or scholarships or more sort of general uh, questions related to the university or Sweden or anything like that, please join our webinar on Friday where we will have uh, those kind of webinars on how to apply and other general information. Um, you're very welcome to ask any questions you might have in the Q&A, and we will try to address those during the webinar. If you see any questions that uh, somebody else has written and that you also have, it's possible to like or upvote that question so that we can prioritize questions that we see uh, are relevant for many of our attendees. So uh, that's just some, some housekeeping to keep in mind here as we get started. The chat is disabled, so stick to the Q&A for any questions you have. All right, uh, once again, warm welcome. I see we have been joined by a few more um, attendees here as I was giving a brief introduction. Um, but without further ado, I think we will uh, start introducing our panel. And I will go in the order where uh, the order I see you on my screen here. So, uh, Frank, you are first. Let us know who you are and which programs you represent. Thanks, Maria. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Frank Shire, and I work here at the Faculty of Social Sciences for the Graduate School. And today I'll be representing four programs. Um, and those are the Masters in Development Studies the Masters of Science in Global Studies, the Master of Science in Social Scientific Data Analysis, and the Master of Science in Social Studies of Gender. Perfect, thank you. And then we have Richard. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Bengtsson and I'm working at the Department of Political Science um, where I'm in charge of the Master of Science program in European Affairs. Thank you, perfect. And Mikhail? Yes. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. My name is Mikhail Martinovic. I'm the Director of Studies at the Department of Human Geography. And uh, today I'm representing three international master programs. Uh, the first one is the Master of Science in Human Geography. The second one is Master of Science in Human Ecology, which also goes under the name of Culture, Power and Sustainability. And also the Master Program in International Development, also known as LUMIT. Perfect. Thank you. And Moira. Hi, I'm Moira Nelson, and I'm a lecturer in political science, and I'm going to be talking about the Welfare Policies and Management Program, which is, of course, a program between political science, uh, sociology, and social work. Perfect. Thank you. And I think we should actually start with a little bit of an introduction to the programs as well. Um, so if we, we go the whole round again, but we can go the other, the other way and start with Moira, can you tell us a little bit about, about your program and what's, what makes it unique? Why should somebody who is interested in this area but is not quite sure about the program, why should they choose your program and what's special about it? Yeah, so um, I think the interdisciplinarity of the program is really exciting. So um, there are a few courses where people from um, uh, who have the main subject in political science, uh, sociology and social work will all take their courses together. So you kind of get a little bit of each perspective. 
Um, everybody who goes into the program has, um, I would say, some general interest in social policy um, and the welfare state. Um, let's say there's some kind of um, focus as well on implementation on that side of things. Um, but there's also room in the program to kind of focus on what you want to focus on. So some people are more focused on Sweden, I can say. Um, other people are focused on um, kind of outside of Sweden, Europe, and some people on you know very different parts of the world, um, very far away from Sweden. So um, so there's kind of room to focus on what you would like to uh, do. And some people are more interested in kind of the practical side of things. The management aspect is, um, as I said, with implementation, kind of very central. Whereas other people are more focused on um, gaining research skills and um, want to go on and do a PhD afterwards. Um, so I would say kind of, yeah, there's room within the program to do what you would like. Um, uh, but perhaps this focus on managerial aspects um, or implementation is a particular uh, focus. Um, yeah, that's a general, I think a general introduction, but I can answer more questions. All right, for sure. For sure, there will be more, but that's a very good intro. Thank you, Maria. Mikhail, what about your programs? I know you represent several programs, but uh, some key points that make them unique. Yes, I'll try to keep it very short mm -hmm. and kind of say what really unifies our approach to education. Uh, so when it comes to, so all of our programs are interdisciplinary, not only in the sense that we are teaching during them, but also what kind of, what kind of backgrounds of students we expect to join us. We don't put very strong requirements of you know, very narrow uh, student profiles. Rather, we welcome students with a broad social science background with an interest in wealth. So if we're talking about the human geography master program, so this is what unifies our, so kind of what brings our approach uh, together is that we focus on various economic, cultural, institutional, and political issues from the clearly geographical perspective. So if you have an interest in how different social processes are distributed in space, this is definitely the program for you to choose. When it comes to our human ecology program, it does more or less the same thing, but where the unifying topic is the concept of sustainability, which primarily relates to the ecological sustainability. So how do we bring our society uh, in the, into the future to live in a more sustainable way on a global level? So that is uh, what's kind of what is the core issue of that program. And when it comes to the Master of International Development, so that is a, that is a program broadly belonging to the Development Studies umbrella, uh, umbrella of topics, but what it does, what we do there is focusing a lot on the practice. So how you actually do international development, not to just analyzing what topics are important, but how do you actually do this? So that is in short, I believe, a short, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. I'll drop it for the moment. Yeah. Otherwise, I can talk for ages. <laughs> I'm sure we can feel the passion. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Erika. Yes, uh, thank you. I think the background uh, for my program in European Affairs is that this is a program in, in political science on European integration, and there are not so many such programs around. And what we try to do then is to combine political and legal perspectives on European integration. So that's um, that's an angle which uh, which is running throughout the program and and uh, which is a kind of unique combination or approach to to European studies. Um, and and in addition to that, we also then have a profile which reflects also uh, what the Department of Political Science um, uh, more generally has as one of its profile areas. And, uh, and that is, we have a, a, a specific profile in, um, in the external relations of the EU. So, EU in global affairs, uh, and and uh, there we we uh, try to actually have both a, a sort of global and a regional perspective on the external relations. So not focusing only on the internal European integration processes, but also uh, you know what 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 are implications for the outside of that, but also how does the rest of the world impact on 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 European affairs. So, so uh, that's a couple of things that make this program stand apart from from uh, the others that that uh, I I know of. Very interesting. Thank you. And Frank, you also have a few programs. 
Yeah, quite a few to talk about. So I'll yeah. I'll also try to think to mention something that's this common among all four that I'm talking about today. And um, I'll actually with that join the train of interdisciplinarity here because our programs are are designed um, with interdisciplinarity in mind, and that's actually their foundation. So. Um, one of the biggest advantages is, um, or one of the things that makes it unique, I'd say, is that you can come to the program with one of, you know, eight backgrounds we look for, which is a background in political science, sociology, social work, social anthropology, gender studies, sociology of law, development studies, or human geography. <clears throat> if you have any of those backgrounds, you can then, you know, would in theory be eligible for any of our programs. And that's the first step of building interdisciplinarity where you might have a background in social anthropology, but then want to apply that within the context of development studies. And so that's one thing, but then you would also be in the classroom with people who also have these, these different interdisciplinary mixes. And that really enriches the classroom experience, I think, um, and in our students' experiences too, where you have all of these different backgrounds and then, um, you get to explore the content that you're here for. Um, but with that said, the the other thing that I think um, is a strong advantage to to any of our programs that I've seen students be successful with is how flexible the third the third term can be. Whether you want to take courses, do internships, go abroad, um, or go on exchange, um, things like this. That's that that element where it can be really theoretical or it can be really practical um, is one of the things that all four of the programs share. Um, that that students can really build what they're what they're looking for within that third term too. So, thank you so much. That was uh, definitely an interesting introduction from all of you. I, I'm not sure you're making it easier for students to choose here. It all sounds very very interesting. Uh, we've got some very relevant questions already, and you know now that we've warmed up and talked a little bit about the programs. The next uh, natural question from people is, of course, okay, but uh, you know, am I the right student? Who are you looking for? Am I eligible? And so on. So we have a few of those that have come in already. So I'm going to ask um, those of you who have these programs regarding those specific questions, but I would also like you to answer more generally speaking, what kind of student are you looking for? So that we both answer the specific question, but also uh, give our attendees an idea of, of the type of student you're looking for. Uh, the first one is for you here, Frank. Uh, this is a student who is uh, interested in uh, one of your program. And the question is, uh, regarding my previous academic background, I earned a bachelor degree in finance and economics with a minor in leadership development. Uh, then I pursued master degrees in social work and nonprofit organization management. In that case, am I qualified to apply to the masters of uh, gender studies? Yeah, thank you for this question. And it's a good one. Um, I'm not sure how uh, positive my answer can be because that background sounds pretty broad and it doesn't sound um, like it might fit the background. But I will say that there, there's a chance um, what we're looking for when you read your application is that you have a completed bachelor's degree is step number one. And then within that bachelor's degree, we're looking for 90 credits of one of our eight disciplines, eight disciplines that I mentioned before. Sometimes students apply not having those 90 credits in their bachelor's degree, but having some in their master's too. And that's what I'm seeing here in your question. Um, if that's the case, we can take some of those credits from your master's and count those towards the, the requirement. Um, but ultimately we're looking for at least the equivalent of 90 ECTS credits in one of those disciplines. So if you're able to, to check yourself, if you have 90 ECTS credits in social work, they would have to be in only social work. They can't be 40 in social work and 40 in something else. Um, so in that case, then, it, then you, you may be eligible. You would at least meet that, that minimum requirement. Um, but if you'd like, you're also welcome to, to email me and I'll, I'll take a preliminary look at your transcripts and let you know if, if it's worth applying or not. Um, and Rebecca, I might, or Rebecca, I might ask if you could help um, put in the, um, in the chat the, the email address you could send any of these kinds of questions to is master for master's programs. So master at sam.lu.se. And in that case, I can, I, you're also welcome to email me and I can take a closer look. 
Perfect. Thank you for that, Frank. Uh, the next one is to Michael. Um, this is also a question about eligibility. So this is uh, a student asking, I'm, uh, I'm in human ecology. Do you know that if it, if it allows me to apply to the master's studies where you need 90 credits in human geography, uh, for example, science and development studies, or is it simply not the same? I don't know if you want yeah, to- well, that. That, um, Yeah, well, <laughs> I will uh, kind of double Frank saying here that, you know, the direct questions about eligibility are sometimes very tricky to assess mm -hmm. because we look, um, we look at the whole kind of, the whole, pro, the whole profile of a student, right? I mean, what kind of courses you've taken and some which you would not, even if they say that these are the courses in human ecology can very well be considered as courses in human geography. So um, in general, I would say that in at least in the program syllabus for a human geography uh, master program, it says that you need to have a major in human geography or equivalent and in treatment of this equivalent, we usually human ecology would qualify uh, but it depends again on the particular courses you've taken, because also the, the particular courses within your human ecology major might differ depending on which in which university you studied before and so on and so forth. So I will say that we try to treat all the social science backgrounds very broadly, but the exact decision is basically based on the very particular a transcript of courses that you have at the moment of application. So you can always uh, send me an email to see, well, to have some kind of preliminary estimation whether uh, you are eligible or not. And you can find my email on the uh, uh, Human Geography Department webpage as Director of Studies, or simply it is dos at cag.lu.se. So that's the functional email for the Director of Studies. So dos at cag.lu.se. Okay, perfect. Thank you uh, for that, Michael. Um, we have a similar question for Richard. It is, uh, let me just go back to find it, how the questions move around a bit as we answer them, but uh, this is not a direct eligibility question, but still an application question, you could say. Uh, the student is asking, and they're saying, I have a bachelor degree in international relations and European studies. And I would like to ask what could make my application more competitive. And they're specifically interested in European affairs. Well, let me begin by saying that I, I, I said before, we, we have uh, a specific political science requirements here uh, for the European affairs program. Um, and that means that we, we uh, want, as has been said before, 90 credits of political science or related areas, which many, many times have been international relations uh, or European studies or even peace and conflict studies. So uh, I think um, it, it depends a bit on from what educational system the applicant comes. And, and as has been said before, uh, again, you know, uh, it, it may be a good idea to, to contact us to see, you know, how we would assess this. Um, but but given the, the, the question posed, I think that kind of background, the combination of international relations and European studies is a competitive one. Um, so generally speaking, what, what uh, would strengthen an application is that in addition to to uh, some of the, the formal stuff that we ask for, the, the, the certificates and so on, we also ask for a letter of motivation. And, and that is an opportunity for, for the applicants to, to um, explain to us why this is important. And, and um, not only, so to say, tell us about their background, but also tell us what they would bring to the program and actually what's, what, what, what would happen in the classroom with them being present. Uh, and, and we could keep in mind then that we have roughly over the years, half, uh, half Swedish students, half international students on, on, on the program. And, and that is an interesting mix of, of them, uh, mostly European students, but also some non-Europeans. And, and in that light, it's, it's very interesting for us to know, you know uh, what, what the applicant in, in, in question here would would contribute to the to the classroom. Yeah. 
Thank you, uh, Richard. Um, Moira, I have another question for you, not uh, eligibility related, but before I get to that, could you give us a general idea of the kind of students that you are looking for for wealth policies? Yeah, so um, it's uh, required, I think, very similar to other programs to have a bachelor's in either political science, social work, or sociology. Um, so I think that's the main criteria. Um, beyond that, it is really just an interest, I would say, in social policy um, and uh, social policy implementation management. Um, so that's um, that's the main thing. And um, I think you can show that with something that Ricard also already brought up, which is um, the letter of motivation. So I should really stress that it's important to include that. I think a lot of uh, students uh, just end up at the end of the day, maybe they get rushed and they don't include that letter with their application. And it, it really makes a difference. We read it. So um, so don't forget about that. And you can kind of elaborate on in that letter on what's not in the, um, the transcript, uh, things that we might not see. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. And the specific question that had already uh, come in to you, Moira, was uh, there is a student here who is a social worker from Greece, and they have a question regarding the program. And they're asking if uh, if we have an established uh, cooperation with social services. Uh, yeah, so um, the social work department is it's it's a practical degree that they um, offer. Um, as many social work departments in other countries as well. So um, the department surely has a number of um, relations with um, social services, um, but I'm not sure if I can speak more to the kind of the kind of collaboration that they have. I might um, guide you to someone working in uh, the social work department in particular, who is Leili Lanemetz. Uh, so it's L E I L E L I L E I L I. Lely, um, and then L-A-A-N-E-M-A-T-S. So I think she will be able to give you more specific information about, um, about that, about the kind of collaboration mm -hmm. they have. Thank you so much for that. Uh, a couple more um, eligibility related questions before we move on to more speak about the content of the, of the programs and so on. Uh, a couple more for you, Michael. Uh, here is one concerning human ecology, and uh, they were asking: Do they need to sub uh, do they need to submit CV and letters of reference with their application, or just the statement of purpose and the transcript? Uh, they checked the website. They said, but they were still a bit sure there. So, do you look at all at recommendation letters? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um... To be honest, this is where, I mean, there, there might be some program differences. I mean, but you, usually it is a good idea to actually submit the references because sometimes we check them because we need that. So even if it is not required, sometimes it is a very good idea. So you're asking how can you strengthen, so for other people asking how can they strengthen their application, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the ideas. Right to uh, to um, at least mention. I mean, probably not maybe uh, write the letters of recommendation, but mention the references so that we can contact people uh, in case we're interested to know more about you. Thank you. A couple of more also for you, Frank. Uh, you always get a lot of these, as we know. <laughs> uh, we have here uh, one student who is interested in the. A master's in gender studies, and they have a degree in interdisciplinary cultural studies, which counts as humanities. Can they still apply? Unfortunately, this does not sound like a background that would um, make you eligible for the program. Um, all the disciplines that we that that do make you eligible have to be within the social sciences, and it's one of those eight we list. Cultural studies is unfortunately not equivalent to one of those. Yeah. Um, Sorry for the bad news. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's better to, to hear that now. <laughs> and yeah, we have a lot of other programs, uh, so <laughs> hopefully they'll find something else of interest yeah. there. Uh, one more for you, Frank. Uh, the student is doing peace and conflict studies, and they're asking if they are eligible for the global studies and development studies. And they would also ask, they're also asking if you have any tips for the motivation letters for these specific programs. 
Absolutely. Peace and conflict studies does sound like a discipline that's eligible. And I know we've had some students in the past who have, who have taken that. So, so that sounds good as long as you can count 90 credits within, um, within that. And of course, you're welcome to email me at the email address that, that Rebecca posted in the chat um, if, you want, if you want me to take a look. But that does sound, that does at least sound like, a, like the right background. Mm -hmm. When it comes to tips, um, I would say one of the, the, the thing is that there are questions that the program director has written for the, the letter of motivation. So she wants to see how you answer those questions. So those are on our website. And I would say, um, Rebecca, if you wouldn't mind posting the link to that, it's graduateschool.sam.lu.se forward slash how to apply. And um, on that web page, you'll see um, those questions. And my tip is just to answer those. Um, mm -hmm. And that would put you in. Um, good shape for that, I think. Yeah, yeah, well, it's good that we can uh, keep clarifying this because we do get a lot of questions regarding uh, those programs specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's one that I really uh, like, and I like to, to highlight it because I know that it, it comes up quite a lot as well. And this also concerns you, Frank, and also Michael. Uh, so I'll let you both answer this one. And what is the difference between LUMID and development studies? I don't know who wants to start, Michael, maybe? Well, Frank was doing this more times as, as me, as you said before, Maria. So I'm wondering on his, on his answer, and then I'll come with my perspective. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, Go ahead, Frank. Definitely. Um, I mean, I think this is an excellent question, and it's one that we get a lot. So um, it's so great that we're bringing this up. And um, I think both programs are, are really great when it comes to getting into this field. Um, I don't think you can go wrong, but there are a few differences that I've learned about over the years that might be relevant for you when you're planning on which one you want to decide is your top pri prior or your top prioritization or just the only one that you'll apply to. And the first one is that, like Mikhail mentioned earlier, there's this um, built-in practical focus that I've learned about with the LUMID program. And that it's not as built in with the development studies program at the graduate school, whereas the one at the graduate school has the flexibility, has a flexibility to, to make it more theoretical, or you can go abroad instead. There isn't, um, the practical component is only there in the third term if you choose for it to be there and you want to go on the internship or do the research or all of those things. Um, so that's one of the things that, that I've learned. Um, the other part is the, um, well, I guess they're both pretty interdisciplinary, but um, I think that there's at the graduate school, this discipline, interdisciplinary focus where you could apply to it, the program with a gender studies background or a social work background or all of these different backgrounds. Um, and then you're assigned a major at graduate school based on what your background is. And that major really determines where you write your thesis. So you might be taking the development studies program at the graduate school, but if your background has been in gender studies, you'll actually write your, your master's thesis at the gender studies department not at graduate school and not at the Department of Human Geography. But if you came to the, the program, the LUMID program, then I think you would, you know, in all cases, be writing at the Department of Human Geography, which would be relevant to your background and would be the best case scenario for you. It's what's most personalized. So, um, so those are some of the things that, that I've noticed over the years students and prospective students tend to really care about. Um, is there anything you'd like to add there, Mikhail? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there are also some practical differences. I completely agree on the academic side, right, with the focus a bit more on the theoretical aspect of the development studies and a bit more on the practical work. But there are also, so for instance, for Lumen, there is no requirement on the previously completed education in terms of subject area. So Lumen okay. accepts students from all the different subject area backgrounds. It doesn't matter if you're coming from public health or engineering or economics. You need to share, you need to have the passion for development work. But where the uh, where we what we do expect is some relevant work experience. So we like to see people who worked as volunteers for NGOs, who did some activist work within uh, within the development uh, area. So this is where on the practical side. So if you are passionate about development studies, but you do not have a major in development studies or any social science background, you could still be eligible for the Lumint program, which would you would unfortunately not be eligible. When it comes to the development studies program at the um, uh, at the uh, graduate school, but in terms of the academic focus, yes, I guess Frank summarized it very nicely. 
Mm. Yeah, and but I think that was a great point there for, for you to add, uh, Michael, as well. And I see there was a specific question about this too. There was somebody here who had a completely different background in, in finance and management, but they have been working in the development sector with nonprofit organizations and were asking exactly if they were eligible for, for LUMID. And, and as you explained, you do take students from different like that. backgrounds. So um, that, that's great. Sorry, Frank, you wanted to add something more there, I think. I was just going to second that that's a really great point. And yeah, the, yeah. the finance background, for example, wouldn't be eligible for our program, but yeah. would be for, for the Lumen program. So exactly. that's a great, yeah. Yeah, uh, we are keep, keep we keep getting more and more questions about eligibility, and I just want to say we won't be able to answer them all. Uh, we understand that we are in the middle of the application round, so of course people are in, in the middle of applying, and and uh, we understand that you have these questions, but it is hard for us to for the panel to give a clear answer and say yes you're definitely eligible or no you're definitely not because they do need to see your documents or get a little bit more information uh, from you so if we don't answer all of your questions today i'm sorry but you will be able to email us and and get a little bit more insight at least well you might not be able to get a straight yes or no but at least an understanding of what's most suitable for you to apply to uh, because I do want to move on uh, to talking more about the content of the program and, and uh, uh, to get some more insights about what's uh, special about the programs and how they're structured and, and so on as well. Um, so I'd like to um, move on a little bit to that. If you, uh, We have a few specific questions, but I also would like uh, all the panelists, if you can talk a little bit about how your program is structured in terms of teaching, uh, possibility to do internships, uh, you know, number of uh, lectures, class size, like just give us an overview of uh, how big the cl class is and what a sort of typical week looks like for, uh, for a student and also the structure over the, the two years of the, of the programs. Um, we can start with Moira, if you can explain how what does it look like as a student on welfare policies and management? Yeah, so um, there's usually a cohort of about 15 to 25 students, I would say. So it varies um, varies a bit from year to year. And it's about half uh, students, half the students are from Sweden, half are from um, the rest of the world, other countries. So um, I can say a few, we've had students from uh, Germany, Switzerland, um, the UK, US, China, Indonesia, Brazil, so um, a wide range of, of places, and um, it's interdisciplinary, as I mentioned, but the students will have a kind of main area. Um, so the first four courses uh, you take as a cohort, um, and you focus on the main themes of the program, so um, social policy kind of regimes, management, organization, leadership, and then economics. And then after that, you kind of start to specialize a bit more in your main area. Um, and there's also room for an elective in at the end of the first year, um, and or I should say an elective or an internship. Um, and there students, a lot of students will stay in Sweden and work at the, um, like the municipality, for instance, that's very common, um, or they will go abroad and work for an NGO, um, for instance. Um, yeah, and then in the second year, the focus um, is a bit more on methods and the thesis. So uh, the final kind of semester is where you write your master's thesis, and then you're going to be in um, a you're going to be in the department that is your main area. So you'll have an advisor that is from social work if social work is your uh, main area. Um, and then kind of more on a, a week by week basis, there's uh, typically about, uh, let's say, two lectures and a seminar per week. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how things will look on a more day to day or week to week basis. Interesting. Thank you for that. Rikad, what does was it what does it look like as a student in European affairs? Right. Thank you. Well, um, we have in terms of the program structure, we have um, a set first year, I, I could call it, uh, where we have four different 15 credit courses uh, that all students of the Master of European, European Affairs program take. And we start out with a quite broad course uh, named European Governance, which is about all aspects of the EU system and also the interface between the EU level and the member state level. And, and many, many questions that are typically sort of European studies uh, questions on, on, on the EU system and so on. Uh, 
And um, it's it's quite intense in terms of, of uh, teaching and learning activities um, with, with uh, lectures and, uh, and seminars and uh, presentations, but also a thing that I know a lot of students appreciate, and that is um, a role play that we have as also part of the examination of the course, uh, where students actually uh, are to play um, play the role of different governments and institutions in a negotiation game on 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 a legislative proposal in the EU system. So that's quite uh, quite nice, and it's also a very good way to to get to know each other. Uh, so after that, the the MEA group, uh, as we we call it, is is quite is quite uh, well set actually. Um, then we also have courses uh, on methodology, on, on EU law that I mentioned before is one, one important perspective for us, and also on EU in global affairs. So that's the first year, uh, which is uh, on site in Lund. Then when we get to the second year, um, the, the third semester is then um, a semester of electives uh, or in terms of studying in Lund or elsewhere or doing an internship, um, which at least over the years, half of our students have done. Uh, it varies a bit, but but still, it's quite popular um, to, uh, to, to do internships. Uh, typically then in Sweden, local government or central government, and, and of course also in Brussels or elsewhere in the, in, in the European institutional system, so to say. And then the fourth semester, uh, we have, uh, as, as the others, a, um, a, a thesis uh, course running for the, for the full uh, semester. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think I mentioned before, we, we roughly have half uh, of our student group from Sweden, the other one then from mainly Europe, uh, but, but also uh, from uh, North America to to some extent and and also Asia uh, less so from 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 Africa uh, and South America. Yeah, I think I, I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, Michael, what does it look like in your programs? I understand it's hard to answer for several programs, perhaps, but maybe... yes, I'll try to keep it brief. I mean, so yeah. for master programs in human geography and human ecology, this uh, the structure looks. Uh, uh, more or less uh, similar to what Rickard was just describing. So the first year is a bit of a set menu where students are introduced to the to the disciplines, so human geography and human ecology first, and then go for the courses on the theory of science, methods, and a bit more kind of narrowly focused courses around the main topic uh, of the program. Uh, and then the second year starts with a semester of either doing the exchange studies or taking uh, elective courses at Lund University or doing an internship. Uh, and then the final sem semester is writing a thesis. Uh, when it comes to LUMED, it's a bit different. So the first year is the campus-based courses, so which is also a set menu, while the third semester, so uh, autumn in the second year, is actually field-based courses which have the very specific kind of syllabus, but uh, you do the uh, field studies abroad, uh, where the first part is doing some kind of learning about the international management practice in a host organization within a course, which is called fields, uh, field course in the program management, and then also the field methods course. So it still has a very clear syllabus, what you expected to learn, so it's not completely free internship in this respect, but you're also doing that abroad at a host organization somewhere usually in the global south. And after that, uh, you write a thesis. Perfect. Uh, we have some specific content questions for you, Michael. So before we, we move on to Frank, I, I want to dig into this since we are on the topic anyway. Um, and this one's, these ones are specifically about human ecology. So they were asking, and you, you mentioned it already briefly, but they were asking here, is there a dedicated field work or desk work time to do research for the thesis, meaning that students, for example, travel to a different place, or do the courses take place at the same time? Time, what does the research period look like? So in, in the human ecology program, the thesis uh, is uh, the whole semester. So usually the, the average student, so to say, or the expectation is that the student starts working on a thesis in mid-January and um, starts with some kind of field work if the thesis involves the field work. 
And there are no courses running in parallel with the thesis process. And that applies to all of our master programs. So we don't have uh, parallel running courses in the final semester. It's only dedicated to thesis. Sometimes some students, when they do their internships in the fall semester, already start doing the field work, which they will then uh, use in their thesis. But that is uh, by the decision of the student themselves. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that clarification. And there was another, uh, also, uh, same program here. Um, and it said, I believe there is an option to take elective courses and or do an internship, as you were mentioning. If we were to take elective courses, does that mean we can choose whichever course we like or are there some restrictions? And also uh, they have a second question, which is if you have any tips about the statement of purpose, that would be great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, uh, when it comes to elective courses, usually they need to be approved by the program director because they need to contribute to the overall intended learning outcomes of the program. So usually you as a student would conversate with the program director and check, okay, is this okay? Does that sound as a course that would go nicely into the overall framework of the program? And to give a bit more detailed answer here would be stepping on the territory of the program directors. And I don't want to yeah. do this. When it comes to the statement of purpose, one advice when I can give to all, all of the students, not specifically applying to our programs, is try to avoid writing generic statement of purposes. Not just because you want, for example, not what, why you want to study human ecology in general, but why do you want to do this in Lund at the Department of Human Geography and the Division of Human Ecology? So tailored statement of purposes give you much more points, so to say, not explicitly points, but you know, in, yeah. in yeah. language, uh, than just those kind of generic statement of purposes, however good they're written. Mm -hmm. So try to explain us in those letters, why is it, why is it, why are you applying to this specific department? Maybe mention work of the people who work here, who do research here and so on. So try to avoid, uh, yeah, the more general approach. And I, and I think we can pretty safely say that that goes for all programs at Lund University. I think everybody wants something as specific as, as possible to, to really, that it really comes across your, your interest in the program. Uh, one final one for you, Michael, which was also related here. How many uh, students do you admit uh, roughly to the, uh, this was specifically for uh, human ecology as well? Okay, uh, so uh, the expected uh, count, so what we usually expect to have is 35 students in the human ecology program, 25 in human geography, and 40 in uh, LUMID. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. It depends on the particular year. Mm -hmm. But the expectations is around, yeah, between 25 and 40 at different programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think we, we now will get to Frank uh, to talk a little bit about the structure of your programs. Yeah, totally. And it, it'll sound um, fairly similar to what you've heard already, because that first year is really already planned out for you. And that starts with the first course that's in the profile of the program you've been admitted to, whether that's social studies of gender, development studies, global studies, <clears throat> whatever it might be. Um, and then it leads directly into um, this is your first term. And I guess I'll, I'll preview this by saying we do follow this typically Swedish model where you're taking one course at a time. Um, and not several courses all at once. And that's something that is is new for some of our students um, and something that I think is, is, is pretty cool about studying at Lund University is, is that you get this model um, where yeah, students take one course at a time and the first course is, is in the profile of the program you've been admitted to. The second course is in research methodology. Um, the third course is starting in the spring semester is also in the profile of the program. And then the rest of that term is a bunch of elective research methods courses. So you get to choose um, two elective research methods courses that are relevant to what you want to either build in your research toolbox or um, plan ahead for your thesis if you think you might do some sort of qualitative or quantitative data, data analysis, a discourse analysis. Um, research with software um, and the qualitative, we even have a qualitative analysis with software um, pro, or course. So a bunch of courses like this that you get to choose from. Um, the third term is really where you get to tailor your education to meet sort of your own academic and professional goals or plan ahead for your thesis if you want to already be 
um, gathering data in your third term, such as in the field. Um, but that is, um, that's really where you get the most flexibility to choose if you want to take elective courses, go abroad, do um, an internship, things like this. I will say for anyone who's interested in the program in social scientific data analysis, you are required to take two elective courses during that term. So if you, if you want to go abroad, it would, or do an internship, it'd have to be only for half the term. Um, and then otherwise, like all the other programs you finish with, um, with a, um, a course in the master's thesis and all throughout this you know if you're if you're wondering how it feels to study how how it looks practically when you're on, in the classroom um it's really a few in class sessions per week whether that's a few lectures maybe one, two lectures a seminar or two and then filling up we still count these you know these are full-time studies so um up to you know 40 hours a week of work because this is you know independent master's level um master's level education so there's a lot of independent reading that you have to do to catch you know to get on on the field and, and in the field and then um also very very common for the swedish model where there's um a fair amount of group work too and um the group work whether that's projects or writing together preparing presentations for seminars together um, and that's that's actually really fun, I think, because you get to then meet your classmates on a whole new level um, and experience that interdisciplinarity in action because they might have different backgrounds than you um, and you get to bring your academic backgrounds or, you know, even your backgrounds from where you come in the world, where you come from in the world. And, and really, that's where that is. It's like a magic moment, I think, too. So, mm -hmm. so that's sort of how it feels to study, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Frank. One specific question for you uh, was regarding the third semester in terms of internships or exchanges. And the question was related to, do students have to look for these uh, institutions or, or places themselves? Or is it something that uh, you have partnerships for already? Um, yes and no. So um, we don't have any sort of agreements with organizations where they save a number of jobs per year for our students and then you know you can apply to those and it's reserved for graduate school students so there is that level of having to search them out on your own and apply on your own um, but that being said we have lots of students every year for many years who've gone all over the world to do things and we've compiled a sort of list and database of well, a database a, a long list of where our students have gone so that if you um want to work with a study advisor from the graduate school, they can help you plan, you know, according to where students have gone, or we can even try to, you know, connect you with an alumni or something, alumnus or alumna who has gone and done that through our alumni network. Um, and those kinds of things, so you can sort of, you know, test the waters and see what works for you. But we don't have any um, reserved places at any sort of institutions where they're waiting mm -hmm. for students for the program. And we actually have the same question that has come in for, for Richard uh, for European Affairs. If your department supports students in identifying placements for internships or, or yeah, if there are relationships there already. Right. And I, I think my, my answer is along the lines of Frank here that we don't have um, specific slots that we can that we can help our students to uh, to secure. But we have a lot of information about where students have been in the past. And there are some recurring patterns in terms of, of, of EU institutions and also on the Swedish side uh, and on a number of other European countries side, uh, uh, central government positions that are repeatedly sort of come back in, 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 our, um, uh, in our batches here. So, so uh, we can point students in, in, in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Now, uh, we have a question for Mikael uh, that I definitely cannot ignore. We have a lot of students who are, are have been asking this, actually, or who have liked questions about this. And it is about the human ecology, a very popular program in this session today. Um, and they are asking me what the difference is kind of between human ecology and our programs at Lund University that we sort of highlight as our uh, sustainability and environment programs such as LUMES and uh, environmental management and policy because we have a few 
interdisciplinary programs um, that have sort of a full focus on environment and sustainability. But of course, it's something that you can see in many of our programs. So they're kind of trying to uh, figure out here who should go for human ecology and when should you go for more like Loomis or environmental management? Can you help us here? Yes, uh, well, uh, I would say that uh, the key to answering these questions lies in kind of in the second title of the Human Ecology Master Program, that is culture, power, and sustainability. So whether all of those programs that are interdisciplinary, Human Ecology Master Program has a very clear social science um, focus. I mean, of course, focusing on all on everything that happens uh, in the physical world as well. I mean, I can guarantee that you will learn something about theory of thermodynamics. Well, don't be too scared. Uh, but uh, so there will be, of course, the the so what kind of the physical world phenomena are, uh, how are they affecting our lives? But the explicit focus is on the relationships between people and the nature. So that's basically where it comes, the human ecology part, right? I mean, so we're looking at how the dominating cultures, we're looking at how the, uh, how the power struggles affects the opportunities and possibilities for the future global sustainable development. So in this respect, it is this explicit focus which is underlined in this program in comparison to other programs which are also really great if you, I mean, if we, if you believe, I mean, we all believe that sustainable development is something which is desirable. So they, these all programs are great, but this one is specifically focusing on the relationship between the world of humans uh, within the world of humans in relation to the world of nature. I would put it this way. Yeah, that that I think was uh, very helpful to to clarify. And there was actually a specific question. You already touched on it, but maybe uh, we, we can do it again here. Uh, power is placed quite prominently in the human ecology title. How is it covered in the program? You mentioned it again, the power struggles. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as a non-human ecologist myself, I mean, I probably, I'm not well placed to really answer this question, but I would address you to the, um, uh, to the uh, program coordinator uh, to ask the question, so what exactly, how exactly this is, this is addressed, and you can find the contact information on the department webpage. I'm avoiding to answer the questions just because, you know, it's better to forward it to the people who know rather, rather than to speculate myself. And I don't believe the time and the place to answer this question because that's very, very closely about the academic content. And this is not exactly my strength. Mm -hmm. So sorry fair. for this kind mm -hmm. of, you know, Another well, content well. question uh, for, for you, Michael, but this is about Lumid. Uh, there's somebody asking here, do you mind to explain a bit more uh, what you meant by do international do international development uh, that you mentioned? Yeah, well, this is basically the, the, this is that focus in this program in the practice, right? I mean, so not just learning about what development is what the different theories are out there in the social science to explain the development process, but actually how those can be put into practice while, for instance, working in international organizations or while conducting the maybe academic research, field research uh, out there, right? I mean, so that, that, that is what I meant by doing international development. So the practice of managing international development programs, working for the international NGOs. So what it really means uh, uh, at the everyday work. And this is why the third semester, uh, so the se first semester of the second year of the program, we actually place people in the international organizations, in the organization of, abroad, so that they have this practice still, of course, being within the framework of the program, but we ma mandate that you do not take elective courses. You actually do spend some time with an organization abroad to get experience of an international development work. So that's what I meant by doing international. Mm. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, a couple of ones for Richard as well. Uh, we talked about internships before, but here's somebody asking about studying abroad. Do you have a list of specific countries that the students can study in? No, not really. I mean, um, we, we looking over the years, we have had students on the third semester studying abroad in many, many countries. Uh, as exchange students or 
or in other uh, arrangements, um, we have we, we we don't have any specific set of of uh, well departments or countries that we work with, so to say. We leave that we leave that open. Our academic advisors uh, are of much help here in in preparing for this. Uh, some of some of this is um, is. Uh, necessary to think about already during the first semester. So we, we have a set of, of information meetings to sort of make sure that not only for the internship um, preparation, but also for 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 this uh, question of, of uh, exchange studies or, um, that we, we we plan ahead of time, so to say, but not, not a specific uh, list of, of required universities in any way, no. And another related one uh, to, to you, Richard, uh, somebody is asking here about research opportunities outside of the thesis. Is it possible to, to help out in a research group, for example, within the department? Mm -hmm. um, in a couple of ways that, that could be possible. Um, uh, one, one thing that I should mention is that at Lund University, we have something called the Center for European Studies. Uh, which is a network organization uh, where four different faculties, um, social science being one, is um, bringing together researchers from, from, from Lund University that deal with European matters of very different kinds. And, and uh, from time to time, there are uh, opportunities for, for, for uh, being part of projects that, that are under that umbrella. And also, uh, we have had some examples at our own department of... Um, of, of research assistance uh, or, or similar. So uh, that, that, uh, that is a possibility, although there are not all the time a number of open positions. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit ad hoc in that sense, depends on, mainly depends on, on what kind of research projects that we have running for, 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 for the current time. But I could mention also in, in addition here that, um, some of our students have, have, have done internships with research institutions in, well, in Sweden, but primarily in, in, in other European countries. Uh, and that has meant that they have combined a sort of, you know, work experience and actually uh, digging deeper into some, some, some research uh, related European matters. And that may be, that may be uh, one way of, of approaching this to, um, to try to turn the internship or the elective semester into a sort of research preparation uh, uh, part, and a, and 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 uh, some uh, some students also develop an interest for specific subjects during their internships, uh, and that means that that perhaps in in terms of of, of, of data collection and so on, the internship is also relevant in that sense, uh, and and in in effect, then um, promoting the, the the thesis work that is coming in in the fourth semester. So there are a number of of, of different sort of openings for for trying to to yeah. to make this uh, uh, relevant dimension if if uh, if that is of interest. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. Uh, time flies. We only have one minute to go. <laughs> So we won't uh, be able to answer any more uh, specific questions, but for those of you who still have specific questions, uh, please uh, refer to, to the email addresses that uh, my colleague Rebecca has been posting there in the chat. And also uh, I want again to highlight for those of you who weren't here right in the beginning, we do have uh, more webinars today in social sciences. They're representing where well, we will have a panel representing the remaining programs that are not here in this webinar. And we will also have one with students from all different programs. So if you have questions more about what it's like to be a student, um, get their perspective both on student life and specifically in their programs, please join that. That will be at 5.30 um, Swedish time. But I do want to give uh, just uh, 20 seconds each to the panelists or any final notes you want to say about uh, the program before we close down um, the webinar for today. That's uh, final words, Moira, <laughs> we'll start with you since the others have been talking more here at the end. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just that uh, if you're at all interested in social policy and social policy management, then apply. 
Um, it's a great program. And um, remember to include um, a letter of motivation and writing sample. These make a difference. Yeah. Thank you. Michael, final words. Yes, uh, well, thanks a lot for a lot of interesting questions. It seems that the programs are raising a lot of interest. And I, yeah, I will just double um, uh, Moira in saying that please focus on your letter of intent or the, uh, the letter of motivation when you are applying, because that is really what makes your application to stand out. Perfect. Frank, any final words? Just wanted to thank everyone for being here and it was great talking to you. Um, I'll, I'll also join the same train that Moira and Michaela are on about the this letter of the motivational letter. Um, we include instructions on that. It really does help um, for your application and we include all the questions on our website here. Um, I look forward to reading anyone's application who applies. Thanks so much for today. And Rick, final words. Well, yes, let me just say uh, thank you to all of you for attending and, and also repeat what has been said about uh, not least the statement of purpose, which I think is, is an opportunity to, to, to get across uh, to us. And, and also uh, regarding European affairs, I think you know, we're now in a, in a very interesting and important time in European politics. Uh, and uh, our program is really an opportunity to, to deal with, with current issues, but from a scientific perspective. So uh, I am hoping for your applications. Perfect. Thank you so much to all panelists and thank you for, to the attendees and good luck for all of you who are in the middle of your application. Thank you and bye bye. <laughs>